Okay, so this is part two of the data viz handbook checklist for project four, um, San Francisco State University Information Design, fall 2014. Um, so I'll get the get the booklet. So this is actually the booklet which you can get also in fold out forms or um, if you have the patience to download it and print it and stitch it and trim it, you can do it uh, just like this. And um, in the description below of this video, you will see the, uh, the link to the actual, uh, you will see the link to the actual uh, booklet if you want to print more copies, okay? So one of the, uh, one of the no-nos was do not screen type because the printer does not print gray, but it prints black most of the time, unless you use a spot color. And now I cannot find which one that is, so I'll look in the list. Um, that's number 15. <coughs> um, this one, and I brought a book, a uh, nice book by a friend of mine in Milan, actually, about uh, a shop that made uh, chassis, you know, tubular frames for uh, race cars and other things like bicycles as well. And so the book is printed in two, uh, let's see, printed in four colors, actually five colors. So you have, um, you have the cyan and you have the, uh, uh, of course, the magenta, which is needed and, and the yellow, of course, to uh, print uh, the reproductions of, you know, full color photographs. Uh, but the two colors are used also as a nice um, kind of detail. So the magenta is used for some of the line drawings uh, the, uh, and the cyan as well. And maybe it's used for the captions too. Uh, no, just for that. So the type is all black um, except uh, for example, at the beginning here in the front, in the very first page, where the uh, these logos are printed in the gray, which is the fifth color. So the photographs, which are black and white photographs in the book, and unfortunately I wish I could zoom in, but I can't, um, but you would see gray dots and black dots in this, um, in this photograph, which make for a richer reproduction. It doubles the amount of values you can get from a black and white photograph if you use a second color for what's called a duotone. And just to repeat that once again when you screen type and you're trying to get um, uh, gray, and of course I was hoping I could show it, but um, I can't zoom in close enough because because um, uh, I can't, uh, but this would show solid gray color without a dot pattern. Okay, uh, I'd forgotten that I can't zoom while it's taping, but um, let's see. Okay, gray type. Let's see, possibly. Be dark, but perhaps you can see. Let's see. Yeah, so there you go. You can see that, that type, even though it's, oh, actually it's picking it up. Wow, I like this. Uh, so it's a little fuzzy because the edges, it's, it's really tiny, of course, but there is no dots making that, that, gray, that gray type. It's really solid, uh, solid gray, as is in that logo, um, right there, okay? Which means that if the type is sharp, it will stay sharp, even though it will be a different, oops, sorry, right there. So the type will stay sharp, whereas Nowadays, because we just use CMYK and not additional colors because it's cheaper to do it that way, um, type gets screened all the time. And it's the fed, of course, because it just looks fancy and delicate and whatnot, but I think it's bad. Uh, this happens to be a page on concept maps in a book called Universal Methods of Design, which is actually a good book, um, except for the fact that the typography sucks because it's totally light. It's just way too light. Whatever this font is, it doesn't work the way they're using it. It's too light and it's not black. And the tone of the page 
you know the the gray value of the page is just too light overall but anyway let me show you an example of um, and I'm gonna have to turn it otherwise I can't so the type at the bottom here it's a list of words and some of them are highlighted in black and some of them are left in gray um, or perhaps maybe this even this caption there's a caption here which says see also it doesn't matter that it is um, it is upside down now but I'm just gonna bring it up and trying to show it and hopefully this won't be a big embarrassment but if I zoom in okay it's a little out of focus but uh, and it's fairly oh wait a minute see yeah. Uh, so that screen, because it's using the same black, I think it shows a little better here. There you go. Can you catch it? Okay. So that screen type, using the same black to give a, an illusion of gray. Uh, it's a little fuzzy because it doesn't, uh, there's not enough light. But um, so at this size which I'm guessing is maybe you know eight point it's still you know manageable but if you went down to five or six uh, it would just be really really hard uh, and again the trouble is that on your screen it looks beautifully solid but it's not when it gets printed last week I talked about a little bit about this guy Jacques Bertin who was this cartographer who came up with these uh, ret so-called retina variables that you can use to um, differentiate your graphs and I listed the items and I'm gonna go through the list again uh, because I actually failed to mention a very important variable um, so let's see if we can show it all um, so the four, the seven different variables are size, right? You can differentiate by size, by area. You can differentiate by value, different grays, darker, lighter. You can differentiate by texture, which is not used so much anymore because it's so much easier to use the others. But in the days before computers, this was used a lot. Um, it's still used in cartography. Of course, you can differentiate by color. <coughs> You can differentiate by orientation, right? The different orientation that your maybe texture might have. And you can differentiate by shape. Um, one important uh, variable, which it really contains them all, is actually what is called in geographic position, X and Y. And that is the position in the field. And I'll get back to that in a second because it's really super important. But before I do it, I want to talk just for one second once more about the color variable because um, aside from the really difficulty in remembering so many colors when we use them in our visualizations um, the very important thing to remember is that color is not ordered Okay, so unlike, so I'm going to write that down, not ordered. Uh, that is, it doesn't have a natural arrangement from less to more or darker to light, uh, as, for example, happens in a grayscale value, uh, where it's immediately, you can immediately uh, kind of position you know each of the elements uh, from lighter to darker for example so <coughs> the colors of the spectrum are not arranged like that they kind of go from darker to light and then to dark again right so that means that there isn't what's so a so-called intrinsic uh, order and therefore it's really hard because there is no we don't have like a reference that we can say oh yeah just the, like the colors in the rainbow so this example is very good because it shows that if you had data for, let's just say, the provinces of France, right, and you wanted to visualize something that's more and something that's less, you have to do it according to value first and foremost, so that 10 being the most is going to be, you know, solid, and white being the least is going to be, you know, no dots at all. And in between you have the other values. 
If you took the natural order of the colors, let's say in the spectrum, I mean this is roughly the rainbow, you would see that here that the, the meaning of the data is completely lost, right? Because you have no, uh, you know, you, you start getting these bands which include areas which actually are not in the same range. Um, so the right way to do it is to reorder uh, the natural orders of the colors into an order that's more value-based, okay? So when you go and pick a uh, color palette from Color Brewer, for example, just be very careful when, you, when you're using this. Sometimes you have diverging color palettes for, say, earth and water, and that's okay, but usually it's just two colors. Um, and I don't think they're showing that here, but... Um, so anyway, very important. Uh, colors are not ordered uh, intrinsically, so you have to play at least with value uh, as well. Uh, yeah, so a very important one is the one that's position, right? He, call, he actually called it geo, right? X and Y, right? And the amazing thing about this is that you can literally use the minimum elements in something uh, ab about a particular visualization and it gives you already a lot of information. So where this spot is in relation to these two axes is very powerful <coughs> because it tells you, you know, how big it is going Y and where it is going, you know, X. So um, sometimes all you need is like a scatter plot with a dot in it to tell you a lot of information. Now, granted, people are going to say, well, that's like too abstract. I don't get it. But I think as with all things, um, people will get it better later as they get used to it. Um, and uh, the cool thing about position is also the fact that in a, in a map, You know, if you have the United States and you have a particular position, you know, let's say New York or San Francisco, I mean, we know that that can be plotted exactly, right? And there is a reference, a geographic reference that is very uh, exact. So this is immediately understood. And um, it wasn't really until the cart, right, the guy from the Car uh, Cartesian coordinates, Right, the guy that said, you know, um, what he said, I am, therefore I exist, something like that. Um, uh, he came up with this idea that you could not only plot, you know, geographic stuff on, on the two axes, but you could plot data. Uh, so I'm just going to show one last example where. Um, where um, you could just have one type of data, so maybe consumption or something, or maybe it's like cigarette smoking for like different years. Um, and that's one, one very single type of data, right? I think it's called monovariate. Um, so 1920, 1930. Uh, etc. And that tells a story, right? So the position tells you, you know, how much. So maybe this is number of cigarettes. Um, and I don't have the, now the book from Taffy where he showed that, you know, cigarette smoked versus, you know, lung cancer at a different year. And that's where it gets really, really str uh, powerful because I'm just going to make this up, but uh, smoking in 1960 and then look at cancer, let's say, in 1980. I know the data are, are different, but um, uh, for different countries, right? I don't know. I'm just, again, making it up. So all of a sudden you have positions which of a particular thing like smoking, but it really relates to two different years and to two different things. So you have cancer here, you have smoking here, and you start seeing, okay, there's possibly a correlation, like a causation between, you know, how much you smoked in a particular year and how many people, how much the country smoked in a particular year and how many people in that country got cancer, you know, maybe 20 years down the line. and 
in this case, like there is, they're talking about the same thing. But if you think about it, it's really two unrelated things, right? One is health, one is maybe pleasure, entertainment. And so the fact that we can plot this really abstractly different categories on the two axes and then make connections is very, very powerful. So this would be, I guess, a case of bivariate, um, bivariate uh, data. And uh, it's, it's just like so powerful because all you need is like put dots in a particular spot. Um, and I'm just going to show one more example of something that's like that where you can do more with less. Um, where we say, you know, maybe in 1970 and 1980, uh, let's see. Then, no, sorry, 1970, 1980, and maybe this is, you know, I think that the, it was school A and school B, right? School A and school B, and how, how they did over this particular period. So in a graph like this, usually we shade the columns, right, to show that this is the same item, right? So this is also school A here and school A here in 1780, school B here and school B there. Um, but <coughs> really all you have here is you're comparing the top of the bars. And I'm just going to do it on another piece of paper, actually tracing paper. So tracing paper is the best. Um, so even though a bar graph is an area chart, we could, we could get away with just comparing the top of the bars, right? And we could see that, you know, school A did better over 10 years or after 10 years than school B, which went down. And we could simplify this graph and do what we did before, which is a parallel coordinate graph. And it would look something like that. Um, so I think just another way of saying that maybe sometimes we don't need as much ink <laughs> to do a graph and a scatter plot might be enough or a line might be enough. Uh, and I'm going to use tracing paper a lot. Yeah, so if you went back to those variables that Bertin talked about, one of them is uh, size, which is really area, right? And so a lot of our representations are differences in areas. Uh, so a pie chart is a classic example of that with the only trouble that if you have a very small slice that there is very hard to um, uh, compare and get uh, into details about it and that's where tree maps uh, come in which is a kind of pie that has a lot more smaller slices that can still be visualized. Um, uh, this was a, just a quick and the transformation that you could pretend to have bars that turn into slices, which once again, when you have proportions uh, that equal 100%, uh, this could be assimilated to slices in a pie. Um, oh yeah, a, a specially beautiful case of a tree map is a Voronoi tree map, which is a division of a space that's circular instead of square, which gives the impression that's a little more like a, a normal uh, pie. Um, and it does have, um, I, I think, that advantage of you know just seeing the whole as a circle, a little more uh, unitary. Um, just a quick uh, explanation how to read a plot in R when it, uh, when it outputs all the different possibilities of different columns um, in your data set and now you can combine these two columns and the labels of those columns are going to be displayed along the diagonal um, and then the way to read each particular graph in that system is to just extend that label down to the graph you're looking at and so this label would be the x label for this graph and this label would be the y label for this graph so moving across in that manner and this is a quick way to find out if some patterns actually are meaningful or meaningless uh, usually when you get 
dots in a line like that, it just means it's words, and so it doesn't really know what to do with them. So a lot of times when we're visualizing numbers, they're often what they're called monodimensional numbers. That is, they're just referring to, not abstract, but certainly um, units that have no you know, physical correspondence. So you know, a dollar is a dollar, ten dollars is a dollar, but, um, but it's, just, um, you know, it's just a quantity. So how do you visualize that, you know, aside maybe from like putting all these dollars on the, on the, on the floor next to each other, which would be hard. So what, what we do in this visualization is we take a number and then we could square it, right? We could find the square root of this and we could build a square where each side is, a, is the result of that uh, square root, right? Of that square root extraction. So more often than not, we use rectangles and in bar charts, of course, we use you know, long rectangles. But in all these cases, what we're doing is we're trying to find two numbers that multiplied by each other would give the number we're looking at and also would give a possible shape using those two numbers, okay? And that's done, of course, in the program. We don't need to, um, you know, mess with it, but, um, but pie charts and certainly tree maps are definitely um, processes that, that do that. And the tree map has the advantage of then fitting in all the pieces that we're looking at from the list. Right, so once again, a, gr a, a, a bar chart is really an area graph. We're comparing the areas. Um, and of course, in a bar chart, we want to make sure the width of the bar is always the same. Um, otherwise, it doesn't work. Um, So in a scatter plot, which we were talking about earlier, if we took, let's say, two columns from a data set uh, to plot the X and the Y, uh, in this case, different types of crimes, uh, and then the spot that is identified for these particular crimes, in this case, in a particular state, uh, we could elect to show a third dimension um, of the data, but because we use paper, which is two-dimensional, there's no way to show a third dimension, meaning there is no way for us to kind of come up this way, because in a way we do live in flatland, right, when we look at the printed graphics. So the way to show that third dimension, the Z, is to move actually sideways around that spot. So in this case showing uh, maybe the size of the population of the, of the particular state. Um, Another nice feature of the tree map, which is really hard to, would be really hard to do in a, in a uh, conventional pie, is that you can have these nested components um, starting from the very top um, and going in a little bit like uh, Russian, Russian dolls or whatever they're called, where you find the next one that's smaller and smaller. It's a lot harder to do in pies because the slices get you know, pretty funny. Um, so the thing to remember again in a pie, but also in a tree map, is that the total um, is your total number, and then whatever is inside is going to be representation of smaller numbers, and smaller numbers that might be inside those medium numbers. So if you were to represent it, uh, it's 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 like a tree, okay? And it was in it's called a tree map because it was representing the uh, usage on computer hard drives at the university um, to see like who was using what. So you might think, oh, okay, these are departments, these are teachers in that department using the space on the, on the hard drive. Uh, we, we already talked about this idea that if you use dots, little dots and little people to represent data, uh, areas of data, you might be doing what's called unchunking, which is going the opposite way of actually collapsing a lot of information into smaller bits so they're more digestible, so to speak. And so even though something like a fraction like one third or a simple box that's colored, you know, by sorry, the other way. Well, maybe this way. So this is one third of the whole. Even though it's not as fancy, it might be more efficient than say having twelve dots where, you know, eight dots are small and four dots are big. 
because we tend to count. With our brain, I think, wants to find out exactly, wants to like triple check, double check what, how many dots there are. Uh, but as I said, we don't use pebbles to count anymore. You know, we use place value, which is actually much more efficient. Um, anyway, you should know it comes from Otto Neurath and his development of isotypes, and he was a great philosopher, really interested in uh, progress and educating the masses you know, in view of a socialist state, and um, huge effect on infographics, of course, but some of it may be too much, uh, too much of a good thing. Um, other examples of how you can represent the same thing. Now, this, of course, is much more old, it's much older than this, right? I mean, the pie chart was invented in the 18-something by... Um, uh, what's his name? Not Minard, the other guy. Uh, Playfair, British guy. At the same time, invented the bar chart. Um, and you might have, you might say, "Wow, this is actually even older, right?" Because this could literally be pebbles. However, it's it's not as efficient as that, right? And the reason this is very strong is because we already know we've already been trained to recognize what this means. Uh, so the question often is not what looks best or more in most interesting uh, visually, but what it's already out there, right? Do not reinvent the wheel, I guess, is the, the idea. Oh, yeah, this example is actually good. It's not in the booklet. And again, it's by, um, it's, it's an interesting take of by, um, and, and in all fairness, actually, you should pay attention to this now, in all fairness, it is true, apparently, that diagramming and concept mapping and mind mapping and whatever you want to call it appears to have value when you're brainstorming and actually going through a process of designing something. Uh, but it appears to have much less value as, an, as a teaching tool, as an aid tool later on. Anyway, this book is called uh, Change by Design, I think. It's about design thinking. Um, and it's about someone I actually know, Tim Brown, who is the CEO of IDEO. Uh, and he had, in the introduction um, to this book, uh, he talks how his um, agent said, well, you know, for this book, you've got to have a table of contents because, you know, books have tables of contents. And he said, well, you know, table of contents are like for more linear people, but we designers are about, you know, making connections. So why don't I give the viewer also a concept map. So in the book, uh, when you open it, the very first page, in other words, the back side of the cover, he has this concept map of the book. And so I argue that actually the table of contents, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, etc., is a much better map to the book because the book is physical and the book is finite and is structured in a certain way. Chapter one does come before chapter two and not in some kind of random order at the end. And so his concept map where he shows the title of the book in the middle in a bubble and then the other chapters is a kind of, uh, you know, spoke and note uh, arrangement like that. And then from that maybe even subsets in each chapter is not a good map for the book because it forces you to try to make choices that you don't need to because the book has a certain structure. Um, so some of these references are in the booklet and a very important one again is Ferdinand de Saussure which spawned this movement called structuralism which is um, still very in vogue. That's where semiotics came from and in literature, a thing called New Criticism, which said that you have to look just at the text and never at the author. And in Structuralism, that you can actually analyze a composition and get everything you need to know from it just by looking at the parts and making relationships. And you don't care, like, who did it and what not. Kind of saying, you know, prior knowledge is not important. But it doesn't quite work that way. 